All right, the last unit that we're going to cover for the muscular system is uh, titled Biomechanics. Uh, this is a section here we're going to be investigating things such as stability and balance, uh, coordination, and you know why certain, certain movements are easier than others. Why study it? Well, this is a gymnast from the 1960s doing a technique on the pommel horse that uh, was the way everybody was taught. Now if you look closely at this, you notice that this uh, athlete has a bent body. You'll notice that his hip is really close to his, to his hand, support hand. That's the way the, the skills were taught back in the 1960s. Today, the same skill looks more like this. Notice Olympic gymnast Paul Hom, Olympic all-rounder, nice straight body. And look at where his center of gravity is. The center of gravity, which you're going to work on in lab here, is an imaginary point right about here, where all your body mass is evenly distributed throughout, throughout the entire system. Okay, in other words, if I were to take a, if I took a statue of Paul Hom here in this position, and I drilled a hole through it right here, in the center of mass, I could balance it on a pole, and it wouldn't tip one way or the other; it would just stay perfectly where I put it, because it was positioned in the center of mass. By study of biomechanics and gymnastics has enabled us to do, enabled coaches and gymnasts to look at and improve all kinds of performance. From the 1960s, I speak from experience, there's only one thing this guy could do in this position. And that was put this hand over on this pommel and hope you don't fall off. Same skill, from this position, he's gonna do all kinds of things. The possibilities of the next move are are just about unlimited. So in sports, studying biomechanics helps improve all kinds of athletic performances. So strictly de strict definition, I have it for you right up here. It's a sports science that applies laws of physics or laws of mechanics to improving human performance. So yes, we improve athletic performance. But we also use this in the orthopedic industry. This isn't confined to sports. Because by understanding the biomechanics of how joints move better, we can make artificial joints much more functional. And we don't have to have the peg leg anymore like the old pirates had. Now we can have actually a lower foot, an ankle that actually functions to help the, help the injured person I actually walk more normal. I'd like to review with you guys, you know, the different classes of levers. As you see on the slide here, we have a class one lever, class two, class three. They differ in the position of several com key components. You know, so let's review the components of a lever. For those of you that uh, have had this before in physics, bear with us. Any lever is going to have a load or some resistance. Now, look at the position of the load or resistance on the class one lever. Okay, the load is at one end, right here. They're also going to have a fulcrum or a pivot point. Now, in physics here, all physics classes that I've ever had, we always signify the fulcrum as like a triangle. It's a point that the fulcrum, the lever will pivot on. And the third component is an effort or some force. And usually that's shown as an arrow. So in, on this first class lever or class one lever, you notice that the fulcrum is in between the load and the effort. That's the that's characteristic of a class one lever. Class two levers the load is in the middle. It's between the fulcrum and the effort. This is kind of like a wheelbarrow. If you think about a wheelbarrow, 
here's the wheel, here's the box, and here's the handles, and the guy's going to lift it up. The class 3 levers, you still have the fulcrum, or pivot point, but now the load and the effort have switched places. So the load is further away from the effort. Now levers are a form of a real simple machine. The purpose of a lever is to either decrease the effort, in other words, let's make the work a little easier, or they're going to increase the speed. Now levers, they don't decrease the work, it's important that you remember this uh, physical science or physics. They don't decrease the amount of work done. They decrease the effort. So in other words, you'll do the same amount of work. And work is defined as uh, distance uh, multiplied times the time. Or excuse me, distance, the, excuse me, distance multiplied by the effort. That is the definition of work. Uh, You'll, decrease, you'll not decrease that, you'll only make it seem easier. That's all. One of the things that I'd like you, you guys are going to need to do on this lab is calculate the mechanical advantage of the different levers. MA, mechanical advantage. How much is your force being multiplied? In other words, how much is this machine reducing the effort to complete a task? Now, keeping it simple here, I found this uh, picture here that I was able to copy and paste into my PowerPoint that shows, a, which you guys all recognize as a, as a teeter-totter or seesaw. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the actual formula for mechanical advantage, and I've seen several used in physics. Some, are, some in physics are used to uh, negate friction. Okay, here's the one that I like for our purposes. You take the length of the effort arm and divide it by the length of the resistance arm. It's simple. Okay, so as you look at my teeter-totter here, what's the length of the resistance arm? Can everybody see that all right? Okay, when you look at those two here, mechanical advantage is one. So if you were going to lift a person who weighed 350 newtons, you would have to apply a force of 350 newtons. But if the effort arm was longer, let's say twice as long, okay, so instead of 3.5 <laughs> meters, it's, a, it's 7 meters, 7 divided by 3.5 would give you a mechanical advantage of 2. That means whatever force you push down with will be multiplied by 2. So in order to lift a 350 Newton person, simply divide 350 in half. Okay, and that would be your, the amount of force you would need to lift a person on this teeter-totter. All right, looking at these levers, food for thought to check your understanding on this. So if you're watching this at home, you might want to press pause after each one of these points here to see if you can kind of think through it before we discuss the answer, okay? So first question, is it possible for a first class lever to have a mechanical advantage less than one? Explain with examples, drawings would be okay. So let's pause and discuss that with, your, with the person around you. And yes, it is possible to have an MA less than 1. If you remember the equation, so long as this arm here on this side is greater than this side, you will have an MA that's a decimal, something less than 1. Now how about this one? Is it possible for a second class lever to have an MA less than 1? 
In this particular example, it would be impossible to have a mechanical advantage less than one. Why? Because remember, our equation up there, the effort arm, which is going to be the distance from the fulcrum to here, this is where some people probably made the mistake when they looked at this, from this point, this distance here will always be greater than this distance. If this distance, the effort arm, is greater than the resistance arm, the MA always has to be greater than 1. Now how about this one? Is it possible for a third class lever to have an MA greater than 1? Is it possible to have a third class lever have an MA greater than 1? No, it would be impossible because the effort arm right here, this distance here, will always be less than the resistance arm from the fulcrum to the load. Okay, now in the human body, nature, evolution, whatever you want to call it, design the human body to maximize movement, not for necessarily force. Okay? We want a longer, faster range of motion more than we need maximizing our force. So look at this picture over here on the right. Okay? Look at where this bicep muscle is here. This is your forearm. This is doing the same effort that you see up here in this actual picture of a guy doing a bicep curl. Okay? What kind of lever is this? Yes, this is a third class lever because if you look at this, your olecreon process right here is your fulcrum. That's where everything pivots. Your bicep muscle comes down and attaches to the radius about two to three inches in front of the fulcrum. And your load is out here, the barbell you're lifting. So here's our resistance arm from the barbell to the olecreon process. And that's always going to be longer than from the effort where your tendon is to the fulcrum. This is always going to be a very small number. So this is a third class lever. Look closely at this one for just a second. And yeah, I think you guys know the questions coming, coming up here. Look at where the insertion point is for the biceps and the triceps. Question now. Discuss with your neighbor. What kind of lever system is the tricep? Explain your answer. Now if you look at this, this would be an example of a first class lever because, again for those of you who couldn't see very well where I was pointing before, this point right here is our fulcrum where it pivots. The load that you're lifting is way out here someplace at the end of the arm and our insertion point is right here at the end of the olecreon process. So this would be an example of a first class lever. But stretch your imagination now. What if that arm were fully flexed all the way back? What kind of lever is it then? Yeah, fully flexed. If you had your if you had your arm as your fingers as close to your shoulders as you can get them, then it's a third class lever. And remember, third class levers always have a mechanical advantage less than one. So if you've ever done weight training and you've done those tricep extensions and your arm is fully flexed and you're trying to you lift the weight with it, you know that it's much harder to get the weight going because you're in a third class lever situation. And MA always less than one. As you go a little further down and get about 90 degrees, it starts to get easier because you've changed the lever system. Join here. Look at the insertion for the gastrocnemius muscle. Now everybody, if you look at this, remember that's your calf muscle. 
And on my picture right here, here's your calf muscle coming down, and here's the tendon, here's the Achilles tendon coming down, and look at where it attaches on the heel bone. Everybody see the attachment? Question, what type of lever system is this? Talk about it, try to justify it. Consider this, the effort is being applied right here. This is, the tendon here is pulling up. So here's your effort being applied. You are pivoting upon your toes and your body weight extends straight through here. Using the example I just gave you with the effort being applied here, your body weight going right through your ankle bones, right through here, and your pivot point being here, this would be a second class lever. But some people argue this. If it were a second class lever, okay, it'd be like a wheelbarrow, correct? Is there anybody that can sit in the tub of a wheelbarrow Grab the handles and lift yourself up? No. Yeah. No. The answer is no. So there's some people, there's some people that argue that this is not a second class lever, but instead a first class lever. First class being this. Your pivot point, your fulcrum, being right here in your ankle bones. The resistance out here, you are pushing against the earth. You're not going to move it, but you're pushing against the earth. Your effort, here. So effort, fulcrum, resistance. So some people argue this as a first class lever, and some will argue it as a second class. The topic that I have here is the center of gravity. Center of gravity, here's the definition for you. The average location of the mass or weight of an object. Now, how many of you guys have seen these eagles here that balance on their beaks and appear to just kind of be floating in air? Well, with rigid objects like that eagle, the center of mass is fixed. So you can actually do things like that. But the human body isn't rigid. That center of mass changes quite a bit. Okay, my two pictures at the bottom there show two extremes of a shift in the center of mass. Now, normally, everybody, in a human body, the center of mass is located near the pelvis, you know, right below the belly button. That's where you generally find the center of mass. This is an imaginary point where an equal amount of mass is located on all parts of your body. Front, back, top, bottom, sides, everything. Okay, the man on the left, the real cut individual, their center of mass is going to be located near the belly button towards the center. Okay, now the man on the right, morbidly obese probably, I don't know the classification for sure on that individual, but their center of mass is going to be slightly more forward. That's the point I was making with those two pictures. The guy on the right, the center of mass, is more forward than the guy on the left. And that's going to lead to all kinds of health issues for the center of gravity. As we discussed with our unit on the bones, you know, an overweight man like that or a pregnant woman, where their center of mass is shifted forward like that, it creates strain on the lumbar vertebrae, in a condition we call lordosis. Next topic I have here is stability. Okay, look at my two cars here. Which vehicle is, uh, which of the vehicles on the right is more stable on any sharp turn? For the stability, you know, you want to look for things like that, position of the center of gravity, COG, center of gravity. Lower sports cars, you know, ha are closer to the ground, uh, wide track wheels, you know, like the old Pontiacs, you know, wide base of support, uh, lots of stability. Okay, you'll find that with statues as well as cars. Now, wide base 
a wide base of support is much more stable than a narrow base of support. And I've got some exercises for you in lab here to look at this and develop examples to prove your point. So as you're talking to somebody, you, know, you don't have to say, hey, just because. You can say, hey, when we do this in lab, this is what we saw. This is why we know this for a fact. Let me stop it here then.